Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we are going to be doing the um, AODS 50, 156 final exam review. Uh, a lot of this material, um, you know, is coming from the book. You'll see from your homework assignments, uh, and then of course things that we talked about in lecture. I have. Um, well, let me just go ahead and before I jump ahead of myself, which sometimes I do. Um, Let's go ahead and just talk about uh, the final exam. So these are the instructions um, I'm going to talk about for the next two slides. And um, after I'm done with this, there'll be a question and answer slide. Um, so if you have any questions, just kind of hold off until I get through this portion, um, and then I will answer all questions. Um, so one of the things I want you guys to realize is the final exam is going to be timed. So um, since we're not actually doing it in a classroom environment, we're doing it through um, Canvas, just like your homework. So I wanna make sure that everyone is you know, proactive, thinking about when and where they might do their final exam. Um, make sure that you have enough time set aside to, uh, to do it. And making sure that you have a working computer and you know um, connectivity, so that uh, so that you know you eliminate as many problems as possible, right? So just please make sure you're planning ahead. Um, after tonight's class, the exam actually opens up at 9 p.m. tonight. Not that I expect anybody to be taking the exam tonight, um, but it's going to open up tonight. And our exam days are uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So you have four days to take the exam. Okay. Um, and so, but double check Canvas due dates. But if memory serves me, it is uh, this coming Friday at 11.59 p.m. After that point, the exam will lock. Um, and you will not have access uh, to get into it. So uh, please make sure that, um, that you have completed both parts of the exam uh, prior to this Friday at 11.59 p.m. The strike of midnight, it's locked, okay? Um, the final exam will consist of two separate parts on Canvas. So when you complete one part, you're actually gonna submit, and then you're gonna come back into that module and select the, the, the part that you did not complete, okay? And then complete that and submit it, okay? So um, the order in which you complete the final exam is up to you. Um, the other thing is, is if it makes it easier, um, you know, since there are two separate parts, you might wanna take one part one day, take a, or one night, take a break, then come back and do the second part or take one part one day, come back the next day and do the other part. I really, it doesn't really matter to me how you handle your final exam, uh, how, how you do it. You know, I'll uh, leave that up to you guys. Um, like I said, the only deadline that you're running up against, uh, well, there are two things. One, the exam is timed. So you need to make sure that you finish everything within the allotted time period. Um, so for the true false multiple choice questions, um, that's 90 minutes. And then for the video vignette and writing your burp note, that is 60 minutes. So um, I anticipate, because uh, the video is very short, even if you watched it five times, that's only going to be about 10 minutes of your time. Because literally the video is uh, just under two minutes long, right? So, um, and I do encourage people just like we've been practicing all semester long, um, like we practiced last week, right? You watch the video um, once, maybe all the way through, then you watch it again, maybe you stop it at a point, jot down some notes of where you wanna put things uh, and then run through it again. You know, again, that's gonna be your choice how you do that. Um, but the end result is a fully completed burp note with the appropriate information in the appropriate locations as we've been practicing and talking about 
all semester long. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think that's it on that. And then continuing on with the final exam. Now I've put instructions and reminders in the final exam um, uh, module itself, right? So when you open up the exam, there's going to be a text box and it's going to have your instructions. Make sure you read through all of the instructions before you start the exam, just to make sure that you are clear. Um, so once you open the exam, the timer is going to start, right? So um, don't open the exam until you're actually ready to start, okay? So once you open it, the exam's gonna start uh, and it's gonna show you the questions one at a time, okay? And um, the other thing is that questions and answers um, are randomly selected and shuffled. Um, so in other words, I've created a test bank of about 80 questions total. Um, you're only gonna get about 40. Um, and the reason for that is so that because I'm doing it on Canvas um, and we're doing it remotely, I have to put in some safeguards, not that anybody would do this. So I'm not accusing anyone of anything nefarious or unethical because as future counselors, of course, academic integrity and ethics and all of that stuff we're abiding by. However, so it's not about you guys, it's about my requirements when I'm doing testing um, through Canvas. And, and I'm required to put in as many safeguards as possible to prevent cheating, okay? So, um, so no two students will see the same questions uh, at the same time, if that makes sense. So you could be literally sitting right next to each other and, um, uh, and both open up the exam and start the exam at the same time, you're gonna get two different questions. Um, so uh, also within the questions, the answers are randomly shuffled. So no two students will see the same answers in the same order. Um, and again, that's just a, you know, um, it's a, it's a uh, plagiarism, um, academic integrity, safety, mechanism, okay? Um, now, having said that, um, you know, I've provided you the, the study guide. Um, I know some of you have already been looking at it. It was available last week. Um, I know because some of us have, have talked about it. Um, but the only piece of paper that you are allowed to use for this exam is your burp note checklist. That is the only thing that I am allowing. So you can't have your study guide with you. You can't have your book open. You can't have this, uh, two students sitting together and doing group exam work. Uh, so please don't do any of that. This is a closed book, closed note, closed homework, solitary effort um, endeavor using only the knowledge that you bring with you uh, as you sit in front of the uh, Canvas monitor and do the exam, okay? Um, let's see, I think that is okay. So I know I threw a lot at you with the uh, instructions. So I wanna just take a moment and um, see if there are any questions. If there are, you have two options. You can raise your hand um, using the reactions icon at the bottom of your uh, screen if you're on a laptop, um, or you may put it in the chat. And, and Kurt, yes, I see that you are offended. <laughs> I love your humor, sir. It's awesome. All right. So there are no questions on the example. Um, let's see. So, uh, so one question is, so I will not be able to go back to a question at the end of the test. No, you will not. Um, and then Richard, uh, let's see. How do you know that someone doesn't have their book open? You know, uh, I am counting on your people's ethics uh, and you know, you're, you're going into a field that 
really has a high demand for that. And if you're not able to take my test without cheating, then if I may be so bold, and I don't want to offend anybody, um, but maybe this isn't the field for you. Um, so I'll just leave it like that. So I trust that everybody's going to do the right thing. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, and then, uh, Maria, I see you had your hand up, but then it just went down. Oh, yeah, I have a question. Sorry. Sure. So you said that there are two parts. And Correct. I think you said that we can take one part one day and the other part another day. You can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't know. It, it, that, that's not necessarily my recommendation. Um, and you probably could have figured that out on your own. Um, that's why I just kind of brought it up, if that makes any sense, because it's two separate parts and they're not linked. So in other words, when you can, uh, when you start and end one, it doesn't automatically put you into the second one. You have to manually go in and select the second one. So you could take a break, you could eat dinner, uh, you could do it the next morning, right? So I oh, okay. just leave that up to you guys. Okay, yeah, I was just wondering, cause I mean, if I, I can take a break and eat something and then take the note or the test, whatever I take first. Yeah, yep, you can do that. Now, here's what I will say um, about taking breaks. That's the only time that you can do that. When you're in the exam, once you've started it, you have to finish it at that point. So you can't start and stop the exam like you could the homework. Yeah, so to, thank okay. you. Yeah, just want to make sure that that was clear and not confusing. Uh, yes, sir, Richard, I see your hand. I just wanted to clarify, I'm pretty sure you already answered this one uh, when he typed out the note. Um, like. It, Let's say I'm going through all the questions and I'm not certain about 15. Can I go to 16, 17, 18 and get close to the end and then go back? No, you cannot. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yes, and you will notice that, you know, when it comes to like all the other grading I've done all semester long, it's been pretty liberal as far as that kind of stuff, uh, you know, letting, um, you know, some people even with some, um, you know, valid reasons have gotten to redo some stuff. I've even gone back in and look, re-looked at some grades for people when they were concerned about things. Um, you know, so when it comes to that, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty liberal on that. When it comes to the final exam, I have very firm boundaries there. So I just want you guys to understand that. So, um, uh, please don't email me Saturday morning and say, oh, I forgot all about the exam. It's just a zero. There are no makeup exams. So I want to make that very, very clear. Whereas the rest of the semester, I'm kind of like, yeah, you know, we can work some things out. Um, but it, it, for the final exam, it's really important. And um, it's, there's just a drop deadline there. Uh, and so you guys just have to meet it. Okay. So hopefully there's not. Now, if you're having some issues in advance, right? We can talk about things in advance. I have no issue with that. And we, you know, um, but after the fact, once it's done, it, it's just done. So, uh, all right. Uh, very good, very good questions. And hopefully my answers are clarifying some things. Are there any other questions on the instructions or what is to be, uh, expected regarding the mechanics of the exam taking itself. All right, I'm not hearing any, so we'll uh, go ahead. I didn't raise my hand, but uh, oh, I didn't see note, it. Do you, uh, in the burp note, do you want us to write it on a, like a like a doc and then submit it that? Or yes. We're going to do it in text. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna um, you're gonna create a document just like you've been doing all along and you're going to submit that. And the reason why I want it that way is because it's easier for me to grade. I can actually go onto your document and make comments. When you guys do a text box, it doesn't give me a way to make comments, which I like to do with burp notes so that I can highlight things and say, 
oh, this would be better here, or no, this was a great statement, or whatever, so that, so that when you're reviewing my grades and my comments, that you're actually learning something out of that. And it's much easier for me to do it on a document uh, because Canvas doesn't allow it, me to do it in a text box. So it makes it much more difficult. So. All right, any um, other questions regarding the mechanics of taking the exam? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and, and, and begin the actual review. Um, and where we're gonna start is we're gonna start with, um, um, obviously right here, it says it, screening assessment and intake. Um, now, the PowerPoint presentation doesn't go exactly in the same order as what's on the, um, the study guide. And the reason why was um, I actually decided to prepare this this PowerPoint at the last minute. So I actually did it today. Um, and, uh, and I had never done this before. Usually when I do reviews, we all have our um, uh, study guides and then we kind of go through the study guide and we kind of talk about it. And then I end class and everybody goes home, right? Um, but this time I, I was thinking about it over the weekend as I was doing some other grading and, uh, and I decided to prepare, um, I decided last night to prepare a PowerPoint, which is what I did today. So in preparing the PowerPoint, I kind of grouped topics together that I thought made sense as we go through. And so if you're following along with the study guide, you're gonna see that things kind of bounce around a little bit. So um, I just want to explain my reasoning for doing that. So the first thing I kind of want to talk about and let's have a discussion about, and remember, um, uh, be careful not to be talking over others. Um, so you can either use chat or the raise hand feature and I'll recognize uh, individuals. And I'm gonna have you guys kind of answer some of these questions, right? Because this is your study guide. Um, and this is your uh, final exam review. So I kind of want to encourage some participation here. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is the difference between screening, assessment, and intake? Now, I don't want us to answer that question, but basically this is what we're looking at on this, on this slide, right? So let's just look at screening, right? Who knows what is the purpose of screening? When do we do it? Why do we do Why it? Do we do it? Uh, uh, Judy, I happened to see your hand raised in the screen, but do you know how to use this raised hand feature down at the bottom? Okay, all right. Because I might miss people waving because I can only see a sliver of the class. I can't see everybody. So just be aware of that. Go ahead, Judy. What's the purpose of screening? Um, so to my understanding, the purpose of screening is to be able to make sure that the program the client is trying to get into is suitable for their needs. Um, and that we can meet their level of care. Okay, very good. That's exactly it, right? So screening is uh, the client comes in, they say, hey, I'm interested in your program, or maybe they get referred to you, um, to your program. And the individual conducting the screening, their goal is, is, okay, so first of all, does the client meet the criteria for our program? That's the first thing. Um, you know, so do they have a substance use disorder, for example, right? Um, Judy mentioned level of care, right? So, and we're gonna talk about ASAM in a little bit too, um, but do they meet the appropriate level of care? So uh, if, if you're screening them and, they're, and you're a residential treatment program, but their level of care is really kind of looking at like a 1.0 or a 2.1, which by the way, for those of you who may not remember, 1.0 is outpatient services, 2.1 is intensive outpatient services, and 3.1 is low intensity residential um, uh, treatment programs, right? So um, it, it, do they meet the program uh, requirements? Do they qualify? Um, will we be able to serve their needs, right? So are they appropriate? Are they eligible? So I kind of want you to think about that. Appropriateness and eligibility. Do they meet that criteria? And of course, if they don't, 
then what is our ethical responsibility? Who knows? I see Paul's hand. Our responsibility would be to ensure that we refer them to the proper level of care and provide a warm handoff so that they're where they're supposed to be given their severity. Exactly. That, that is our ethical responsibility. It is unethical to say to somebody, yeah, it's great you're, you're looking for help, but um, you don't qualify here. Good luck. Bye-bye. <laughs> right? That's, that's really not ethical. Um, now, does that happen? Unfortunately, I think it does. Um, but so just be aware as you move out into the field that that is your ethical responsibility. If you're conducting a screening and they are not appropriate or they don't meet the eligibility for your program, you need to refer them to a, a, a program that, uh, for which they would potentially be eligible. And of course, they still have to go through the screening process with that program as well. Hence, your um, resource notebooks, right? That's, that's why we've been doing that work all semester. All right, very good. All right, so um, next, so using the raised hand feature, um, who would like to answer the question, what is the purpose of assessment? Oh, uh, Juanita, I see your hand. Yes, the purpose of assessment is to define what needs to be done. Okay. Um, to define um, after um, doing the initial intake, then uh, that's assess, uh, not assessing, but um, screening. And then assessing is defining okay. um, what um, um, to do next. Okay. Very good there. And I see Renee, who's giving me a double hand. She used the raised hand feature and she's raising her hand in the screen. <laughs> Whoops, wait. So it's also to gather information to get to know your client so that you can, um, so that you can give them the proper, uh, sorry, my dog is whining. Um, so you can give them the, you can direct them in the proper, in the proper way. Right, yes. so it's to gather information. Yep, so we're gathering information as uh, Renee just said, um, and then we're defining maybe what the problem is also, as Juanita said, both, both of you are correct. You had parts of it. Is there anything else that we're doing in assessment? And getting to know our client, definitely assessment helps us to do that. Is there anything else for assessment? Let me use the raise hand feature. And Jules, I see your hand. And then Paul, we'll go with Jules first. Isn't it also to um, um, ask the client or, or I don't know if it's decide, I want to use the proper word, but um, to find goals that they can meet. Is that, that what the assessment is? That okay. may come up, but that is not the primary purpose of assessment. However, you're sort of on the right track. What we're going to do with that information. So we're gathering that information. We're oh. defining the problem. We're getting to know our client. Um, and it is going to put us in a direction for treatment planning, isn't it? Right? Uh, okay. It's really going to help us with that. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, Paul, your hand was up and then it went down. Were you? Oh, I just saw that somebody else had put their hand up. So that's uh, cool. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I would say for assessments, in addition to to working to determine the, you know, what kind of use disorder they have and the severity of it. You're also looking for co-occurring disorders, mental health, EBC conditions, uh, and you're looking for any kind of biomedical stuff that could be uh, concerning or problematic if somebody's got diabetes or if somebody has, uh, you know, hep C, something like that, and they're an IV drug user, those types of things are all really crucial in the assessment. Yes, exactly. See, all of you guys so far there are, that are speaking are putting all the pieces of the puzzle together for assessment. You all are correct on that. Um, when we're using assessment, like what's an example of an assessment tool? Um, well, first, let me, um, Dominic, did you, 
Yeah, I was just going to say the assessment is to define whether um, addiction is present. Okay, yes. Um, in screening, we would have probably rendered a provisional diagnosis, right? Um, it wouldn't be official yet. We're just gathering screening. You're gathering a little bit of information. Do they qualify? Oh, yes. This person appears to you know, have an amphetamine type substance use disorder, possibly severe. We'll know more once we get into assessment. All you need to do for screening is just determine, do they have a substance use disorder? In assessment, yes, you are going to actually go further and establish um, the actual criteria, um, the severity on the continuum of mild, moderate, severe, exactly. Um, and Renee, I see your hand. Um, then we can use it also the initial level of care? Yes. The assessment? Hey, yes. So, um, so a, one tool for um, assessment would be um, the ASAM adult individual level or initial level of care. Um, and we're looking at, uh, different six different dimensions of which Paul mentioned off the top of my head from my memory, at least three or four, right? He talked about dimension three, EBC. He talked about dimension two, biomedical, although he didn't say those words, I'm, I'm saying that, right? So in each of the ASAM dimensions. And then another tool that is used is the addiction severity index, which is actually, if you look at it, is a bio psycho social assessment. It's looking at not only substance use, but it is looking at um, education, employment, criminal history, right? It, it, it looks at a, a person's whole life um, situation, right? So very, very good. All right. All right, next question is about orientation. And so remember just use the raise hand feature. Um, but what is, what is in orientation? What's its purpose? When's it done, right? Uh, Judy, I see your hand. Um, I believe orientation is supposed to be done. Oh, you just put yourself on mute by accident. So I think the um, orientation, if I'm not mistaken, is supposed to be done within 72 hours uh, from when the client gets to, well, for residential, sorry. Um, and it's to make sure that the client understands what's expected of them and what they can also expect out of the program. Yes, exactly. Um, and it should be done, um, which I just realized, we don't have a separate question on intake. Uh, so I'm gonna come back to that. Um, but yes, it should be done fairly soon after intake. Um, and, and exactly it, it's to, to give them um, the expectations, what they can expect, what are the services that are being provided, what's the schedule, uh, what are the fees, um, you know, what happens if you're uh, if you're not able to um, adhere to the treatment um, activities, right? Um, so it it, it kind of gives a nice, well-rounded view of of the program. It, it probably should include a tour of the, of the program, right? So here are our group rooms. Here's where your counselor is, uh, will meet with you. Um, oh, here is your counselor, right? Because uh, sometimes the person doing the screening, the assessment, or the intake is not going to be the person's primary counselor. So orientation is another opportunity to have those two people come together um, and um, also maybe make their first appointment together, right? But uh, but orientation uh, introduces the client to the program. Yeah. Um, Juanita, I see your hand. Yes. Is informed consent um, done at the orientation or I think that's maybe at the screening? I'm not it, sure. So informed uh, consent yeah. is not done at orientation, which is why I just realized that um, even though the very first statement says the difference between screening assessment and intake, I actually didn't put a separate bullet point for intake. So that's a error on my part. So want to talk about- Okay, intake. right, okay, yes, yeah. okay, yes. Yeah. I got intake and orientation mix, thank you. Right, so normally this is kind of like the, the, the order of operations for a client, right? 
we get, for, they, they get referred to us, they go through a screening, right? Then they go through intake. Then they go through assessment. Then they go through orientation. Now, all of that can happen in fairly quick succession, depending on, on, um, on your program scheduling and how that's being done. Um, but the piece that was missing here was intake. And so um, limits of confidentiality is going to be explained at intake. Um, they're going to sign their uh, releases of information or their authorizations to disclose. They're going to um, sign all the intake paperwork that basically is giving us permission to treat them. Um, they're going to fill out health questionnaires or TB questionnaire. Um, we'll probably be asking them. Um, we probably already asked this at screening, but it'll be re-asked again during intake, usually um, on co-occurring disorders, right? Um, also, they'll be uh, go through the, um, uh, oh shoot, I forget the name of the form. Uh, the old name of it was the high-risk assessment, but basically asking about um, history of suicidal ideation or attempts, right? And, and maybe even uh, depending on what happens there, oh, we need to do a safety plan, right? So um, that kind of stuff is happening in intake, which is between screening and assessment. So my apologies uh, for leaving out the word intake off one of these bullet points. Any other um, uh, things that we do at intake? UA. Uh, yes, we may do a, a, a UA test. Yeah, might get a, a baseline. Now that is not on the exam, I can tell you. And Miss Judy. Wouldn't we also assign them their case, like their, their group or their caseload or their counselor and case manager? Yep, we'd probably give them their that case manager information, which groups they'll be attending. Exactly. Yep. Um, and that kind of rolls, yeah, they'll probably do more of that at, at, um, uh, at intake, but that really rolls into, if you think about it, blurs into orientation. So a lot of times, um, you know, like at, at my program, we do intake and then it kind of blurs and melds into an orientation. Um, so if, if we were to ask the client, oh, did you go through orientation, they might not know what we're talking about because it kind of all went together. But one of the things that we do also, um, and this is not a requirement, this is just something that we do um, as an added um, orientation thing is we actually have an orientation group that they attend once a week um, for um, several weeks uh, to kind of rehash some of the things that they were told at the original orientation, right? Because on the first day or the second day, we're throwing a lot at our clients. Are they going to remember all that stuff? No. They sign a whole bunch of paperwork. Half the time, they don't even remember what they've signed. Um, so another ethical responsibility is anything that they have um, signed, like um, consent for treatment, authorizations to disclose, um, that kind of stuff, uh, they're entitled to a copy of it. And we should just automatically give them a copy. Now, I know practically I've been, I've been around long enough where that does happen sometimes and sometimes it doesn't happen. So, you know, as a profession, we can sometimes be kind of inconsistent on that. And I bring that up now because I want to encourage you guys as you go out into the field, it's like, oh, you know what, really ethically, everything I just did with this client, he should have a copy of, right? So just as an FYI. All right, um, so we talked about screening, assessment, uh, intake, orientation, um, talked about consent forms, but here's a question. How long is a consent form valid? Uh, Judy. One year until the client yeah. gives a letter stating otherwise. Right, so there's actually two different time periods when it can expire. 
It's either going to expire when the client revokes their consent, which they can do at any time, or at one year. Um, and so most programs, uh, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm also leaving out another piece. And after they terminate from your program, whether it's successful or not, right? So if they're no longer in your program, that consent, even if it had a year date on it, is not valid anymore because they are no longer in your program. So if anything were to come up and you would have to release information, you would have to reach out to your client and get a new consent for whatever purpose it is that was needed. So that rarely comes up, but it could, you know, like legal stuff might come up or, or um, another, um, God forbid, maybe they go into another treatment program because they weren't successful after leaving and, and they, uh, the other treatment program wants some collateral information. Well, technically, you can't give it to them uh, unless you get a signed release. And CFR 42 Part 2 specifically says verbal is not enough. It has to be signed. So even if a client is saying, oh, I give you permission to talk, great, we'll come in and sign then. <laughs> uh, because you can't do it just based on, um, just based on a verbal permission. Um, all right, so I see a hand and I see a chat. I'm gonna to go to the chat first. Uh, what if it is a PO? Um, technically, that's kind of the same thing. Uh, why would the, let's explore that for a minute. Why would a PO be contacting you after the fact? So I mean, like, what if it's for um, us to have to contact the PO to let them know that their client left? Oh, no, that would be fine. That's, that's, that's permissible because you're not doing that, you know, a week later, a month later, or a year later, right? You're doing it in concert with their, um, with their program. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you have something else to add, Judy? Or... Oh, okay. All right, Jules, I see your hand. Um, yes, I have a question. Doesn't uh, the consent end when the person dies also because? Uh, yes, I didn't want to be so morbid, but yes, it's true too. Okay. Um, and as, uh, as a counselor with that person's file, you are now the, you, you're basically the protector of that individual's stuff, right? So um, no, if a person passes, you can't really send information, um, you know, um, if they leave your program and are gone, or if they, if, you know, terminated, whether it be successful, unsuccessful, it doesn't matter. Um, once they're away, they're away. Um, CFR 42, um, this even covers people who have been referred to your program. So um, you guys probably talked about this in law and ethics, um, but I want to kind of emphasize it here as well. When it comes to confidentiality, CFR 42 part two is more strict than HIPAA. There are things you can do with HIPAA that you cannot do with CFR 42. A, as soon as a client picks up the phone and reaches someone at your organization and says, hey, I'm interested in your program, that's when that confidentiality rule starts. So you can never reveal that they even applied to your program, even if you never accepted them. You can never reveal that they're participating in your program without consent. Um, once they leave, you can never reveal that they were in your program without consent. Okay, so um, very strict then. Uh, Paul, I see your hand. One challenge that I run into often with POs is that they will, after the client has uh, like called to schedule the intake, because a lot of times they'll wait until it's like two days before their deadline with their PO to get into a program. And so that the client's like, I need in today. And it's like, that's not how it works. We got to schedule you. It might take, you know, five or six days to get you in. Um, and the POs will often call to be like, I need to come client scheduled an intake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it's always this like thing of, well, we can't really give that information out because we can't confirm that the individual is a client or not. Um, 
but the PO is obviously well aware that they've yep. called our program and reached out. Thing. Any suggestions on how to answer that without enraging the PO? Well, the way you answer it is exactly th is the only way. Are you going to enrage the PO? Yep, you are, uh, because they they just want their information. Mm -hmm. They're law enforcement. And they're used to having their way, right? Right. That, that's just the way it is, right? Um, it's the same thing, and and we don't. It's not on this exam, but I'll just briefly mention it. It's the same thing covered with um, police officers coming in with warrants, or if there is a, um, a court order to release information, it has to be a very specific type of court order um, and you cannot release it. You cannot allow police into your building. You cannot confirm, even if they have a warrant in hand, right? And you're protected by CFR 42 part two and you just have to explain that to them. Now. Having said all of that, I am a big believer in trying to avoid problems whenever I can. So one of our screening questions is, are you on probation? Um, and does your PO know that you're coming here? What's that PO's name? What's their contact information? Let's do a, a quick, um, uh, you know, are they gonna need to know you're here? Okay, let's do a quick um, ROI. Um, and then you're covered, right? If it's tricky because our screening, the initial screening is over the phone. Ah, so we can't, right, until right, right. they so come in do... for the intake assessment, we can't get them to sign an ROI. Yep. So then what you probably need to do is explain to them that since this is a phone screening and we've signed no documentation, even if your PO calls, we cannot tell them that you've come here. Gotcha. So, so explaining it to the client um, may help alleviate that. Are you still going to get the call from the PO? Yep. You will. And then the PO will have confirmed what the client told him. And then when the client comes in and signs some things, then you can talk to him. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. I know it makes it really sticky. Um, it makes it really sticky when, um, when we're trying to get help for clients too, right? Because we have to, it's, it's like that one homework uh, question where it asked about, you know, the person calling around um, about the um, client that is taking well butrin, right? And we just get so used to in this mode where um, we, we probably give away more information on a daily basis than we should, and we don't even realize it. So just kind of being aware of that. All right, very good. Um, so when is a person in need of medical detoxification? And Renee, I see your hand. Um, so the, they're in need of medical detoxification when they are uh, detoxing from alcohol um, because it can kill you? Yes. So alcohol, benzodiazepines, um, if they are... Um, acutely intoxicated or have a, uh, a history of seizures and serious withdrawal, that is indicative of someone who needs medical uh, detox. So one of your screening questions, getting back up to screening, should be focused around looking at that. And most everybody does an ASAM screening anyway. So ASAM dimension one. Dimension acute, one. Uh, 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 right, exactly. Dimension one. Um, covers acute intoxication or uh, withdrawal potential, right? So most people are already asking that, but if you're getting those indications, um, then they need to go and be medically supervised um, so they don't die. Now, opiates, probably not gonna kill you. You might wish you were dead, um, but it's not deadly <laughs> generally. Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, amphetamine withdrawal, it's not going to kill you. It's just, uh, just going to put you to sleep for several days, right? But we're talking about the alcohol and, and the benzodiazepines. All right, very good. So next, uh, next items, um, we're going to look at suicide assessment. Got a bunch of things here. So let's just look at the first thing. When do we assess? 
When does that happen? Raised hand feature in Zoom. Uh, uh, I see your hand, Renee. So it have, you, you said, not only do you do it in the beginning, right? You ask them for if they've ever had any essays or essays, but you assess them, you know what I'm saying? You assess your client at the whole time they're there at your program. Yes, um, you, you do. Some of it's more formal, some of it's less formal. Can you discuss, um, or anybody, raised hand feature, what would it be formally? What kind of things do we do for a formal assessment? So you ask them if um, they've ever tried to commit suicide or ever tried to do anything um, to plan a suicide. Okay, yeah. Um, and so that's using that one form. Well, you would ask them during the screening, so they get right. asked then. When they come in for intake, then you're going to do the risk assessment and safety management plan. Oh, I just thought of it. That's the big long. <laughs> That's the plan. And you did it really fast. I know. It comes and goes. <laughs> yeah, you ask them, you know, have you wished, you know, in the last month, have you wished you were dead? Wish you'd go to sleep and not wake up? Yes. Yeah. So you're you ask them, have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Yes. And you're you're using the SSRS to do that, right? right? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I mean by formally, because you're asking um, uh, those formal questions pre-printed from a form, you're filling out a form um, with the client, right? Now, if they indicate that they have a history of um, suicidal ideation um, or even suicide attempt, um, what do we do now? Can I say it again or? Sure, go ahead. And then uh, Jules after that. Um, so after that, so then you, well, what I do is I ask, you know, I ask them to describe it, you know, what was happening at the time that that was happening, you know what I'm saying? At that, at that moment, what was the event that was taking place? Okay. So that way that I can know um, whether they were, whether it was like alcohol induced, whether it was drug induced, um, I find out the information around it. And then I also, uh, then I also ask them to give me some goals. Okay. So you're also talking a little bit about safety planning, right. maybe, although you're not really saying it in that way. Um, right. Because that's not my, um, I'm not a, I'm not a LPHA. Okay. So then what would you do then? So then, um, I would call the LPHA and ask them to meet with them so that they can do that full assessment. Okay. That's exactly it, right? So you want to get a second, especially if you have indications that this person has a history, right? So already, if they have a history, if, if we learned from earlier in the semester when we talked about this, you learned from reading in your book, um, that already that's some red flags, right? They're already at higher risk simply because of their history, right? Also, we also know that suicide is a leading cause of death among substance um, individuals that are experiencing substance use disorders, right? It's way up there. Um, so just the fact that they have a substance use history, even without any other history, does put them at risk. So as you said earlier, we should always be assessing everyone throughout the program, exactly. Looking for changes if anything comes up, right? Uh, and then asking, um, you know, doing an assessment, uh, if something comes up, right? So that's a little bit less formal. Does that make sense, right? As we're doing it throughout, right? I'm constantly looking at my um, at some of my clients that um, have a history and I do a series of like once a month, I'll check in with them. Hey, you know, since last month, has there been any other suicidal thoughts or things like that? Um, but in between that time, I'm also observing their behavior and looking for any any changes. So it's a combination of formal and informal. Um, so that how often question is going to vary depending on, on the individual. If they have a history, we're going to want to be doing it more often, right? Um, and probably at a, uh, um, at a structured or, um, I can't think of the word, scheduled pace, right? Like maybe 
you know, I meet with the person this week, meet with them next week and kind of check in with them, you know, for the next couple of weeks. Then maybe we spread that out to two weeks if they're doing okay and they've stabilized. Um, so it just will depend on, um, on uh, what their needs are. Um, so what are questions that we ask? Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, hold on one second, I forgot. Jules, you had your hand up and then it went back down. Yeah, I was just gonna say one thing because they might not uh, explicitly say it, but I mean, you can look to, I, I remember the story you told, you look to see if a client is showing any, like if they had any, the means to do it, the mode to do it, or the opportunity that they're presenting. Um, Cause I remember the story you said how the guy showed up and he already had his car set up. Yeah. You know, so, for, uh, for the exhaust and yeah. you didn't leave him alone and you waited until right. somebody came by and said, can you please go call someone for me? Exactly. So with suicide assessment, um, you know, initial assessment, if there's not a whole lot to look at, right. They're, they're denying and, and we have no known history. They're, 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 they may not be at low risk, but they're, they're not at moderate or high, right? They're kind of in the lower end of the continuum. Doesn't mean we stop looking at them, um, but do they, uh, are they thinking about it? That's the first thing, right? So is their SI present? And if there is, do they have a plan, right? And if they have a plan, do they have the intent? And if they have the intent, do they have the means? So in the example that I talked about with, with the, um, uh, the, the gentleman um, that I was working with, he had uh, the SI, he had the plan, he had the means, uh, and he had the intent. It was all right there, right? So that is what we want to look at too. And the more of those boxes that get ticked off, the higher the risk, right? And... Um, and so as the, as the risk, risk factors go up, uh, that means your action needs to happen, needs to go up. The other thing is, is even after the incident has subsided, say we have a, a, a suicidal um, situation, the guy, the, the uh, man or woman attempts to, uh, they, they attempt to uh, commit suicide, um, they survive and then we're back in our program um, and the crisis seems to have subsided, that doesn't mean that we let up, right? Now we're not poking them either like a bear, but what I mean by that is, is we need to be more observant, checking in with them, verbally letting them know that we're here and asking them those questions. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Like, are you thinking about killing yourself? Have you ever tried to hurt yourself before? Yes. Um, do you think you might try to hurt yourself today? Um, have, I'm looking at what I wrote down in my notes. Have you thought of ways that you might hurt yourself? And do you have pills, weapons in the house? I mean, this is important because you think about a lot of the shootings recently that people have just recently bought guns. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, that, I mean, they do didn't try to kill himself, but I mean, it's just right. one thing that sticks in their mind. A lot of times they do purchase weapons like right before. Right, and, and that's um, a very good reason to have waiting periods or cool off periods, mm -hmm. right? Um, to kind of put a little bit of time between that thought and having access to, to a gun, for instance, right? Um, Juanita, I see your hand. I was wondering about, um... So when you asked, um, when do we assess? Um, I was thinking in my mind after screening or after or when the intake meets the ASAM or the DSM-5 criteria, I don't, uh, yes. assess? Yeah, so you're gonna wanna look at it during screening. You're gonna wanna look at it during intake. You're okay. gonna wanna look at it um, during assessment. And then as the client gets into your program, depending on their level of risk, um, you may look at, be looking at it more frequently with individual sessions um, or less frequently, just depending on your client at that point. But certainly by the time they get assigned to a counselor, they've probably been assessed for suicide three times. 
So you have a pretty good idea of, uh, or some level of assessment for suicide. You have a pretty good idea of where they may be, right? But remember, things can change, right? So, all right. Um, and then the questions uh, that were being recited by Jules, those are great questions. Um, you want to be direct with them. Don't beat around the bush. And, and um, it is a myth that asking about suicide is going to put that thought into their head that it just isn't true. Um, the other thing is you will be surprised how very often people are very honest about their history. They will tell you. So um, if they're seriously thinking about doing it, you will get, you will know. They will, they will give you signs if you're asking the questions. Um, so uh, they will give you the answer, I should say. All right. Um, oh, I see a chat. Let me go to the chat real quick. Make sure I'm covering that because we're going to move on. Oh, so the questions, questions are like off the top of my head. There's probably some in the book, and I know there's some in the uh, lecture on suicide, but things of, are you thinking about killing yourself? Right, just very straightforward question. Um, the answer is yes. Then obviously your follow-up questions are gonna be, uh, how often are you thinking about it? Did you think about it today? Um, if you were to do it, how would you do it? Have you ever developed a plan? Right, um, trying to think of some other question. And some of your questions is gonna um, depend on what their answers are too. You know, this is where being fluid and, and confident in your counseling abilities too will help you with that. Um, trying to think of another question. Um, uh, do you have a gun? Where is the gun located? Right? Um, let's see, if there's any other. Yeah, but basic straightforward questions like that. It's really important to be straightforward and transparent with your clients uh, when it comes to that. And the other thing is that's really important is for you to be calm, have a calm demeanor, empathetic, want to be helpful and not to panic them, right? Like, so don't freak out. That is very important because they're going to take their cue from you. So, all right. Um, all right, any other questions on suicide before we move on to limits of confidentiality? All right, so what are the limits of confidentiality? Using the raised hand feature, who would like to tackle that question? Yes, Paul. Some limits of confidentiality would include any um, information about children being neglected or abused. Uh, same for elderly. Any uh, thoughts of wanting to harm someone, especially if that if they reveal the identity of the individual, that would fall under terror soft warnings. And then any uh, intention to injure or harm themselves. Yep, exactly. One category you left off is dependent adult. Yeah, so, so there's elder abuse, dependent adult, and or child abuse. Um, harm to self, harm to others. Um, we have a duty to warn, duty pr to protect. Uh, and then, um, oh crap, you said it, it just went out of my head. Oh, and I just said, oh crap on YouTube. Um, Oh, it just went out of my head. Uh, I'm sure one of the other students will have it. <laughs> I'm sure they will too. Uh, yeah. Juanita, go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, I think he said them all, but um, and let me the company if it's unsafe. Like, uh, well, I was thinking um, uh, domestic violence, but that's the same thing. Um, Actually, domestic violence, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but domestic violence in and of itself, 
uh, is not necessarily reportable unless a child is involved or witness right. to it, because then that can be considered uh, child abuse. But if it's just two adults engaging in mutual combat without yeah. threat of death, that is not reportable. You cannot break your confidentiality, uh, the person's confidentiality for domestic violence. Right. I mean, unless it was that, that he threatened to hurt her. That's what I meant. But I know the other yeah, one, yeah. it's um, a court order um, from, uh, um, is it federal or both state? It's called a special court special. order. Yes, special right? court. Okay, um, yes. And it has to meet certain criteria for um, uh, for CFR 42 part two. Yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, all right, uh, Jules, I see your hand. Um, yeah, there's three other ones also. There's in a medical emergency circumstances, also when there's qualified research and when, oh my God, there's one more, there's one more, there's one more, um, crimes on the premises. Yes, and even then, they're, they're, um, you can only reveal as much information as required for that particular situation. So confidentiality can be broken for that as well. Ordinarily, when we think of limits of confidentiality, we usually think about child, um, elder, dependent adult abuse, suicide, homicide. Um, it still feels like I'm forgetting one off the top of my head. Um, but those are the main ones. The other items that you described, yes, those are exceptions to the confidentiality uh, rule. And you should be telling your clients that information as well, which would happen during um, intake and orientation, right? And let's see, uh, Judy, I see your hand. I was gonna say, like, if for some reason they have, like, um, EMT shows up or the ambulance shows up, but I think that's also limited. Yeah, and that would fall under the medical emergency um, uh, exception, right? And even then, you're only giving as much information as needed to to get that person the help that they need. Um, let's see. Okay, very good. And how long does uh, ROIs last? One year, yes. Or termination of treatment or death, right? All right. Um, so what is the mental status exam? We did a little bit of work on that early in the semester. So this may be a little bit rusty for you, but what are we looking at with the mental status exam? Uh, Judy, I see your hand. I'm gonna take a guess. Does it have to see where their mental capacity is at? Like if they have any mental disabilities, such as schizophrenia, depression, things like that, or not really? Or is it well, like to learn? Oh, hold on one second. I, hold on one second. Sorry, my lungs have been acting up and I had to had to cough there. Um so yes, part of that, you you you're gonna be looking at whether or not they are oriented. Remember, we were looking at oriented times four which basically means they know who they are, they know where they are, they know why they're there, right? Uh, and they know the date and time, right? So in other words, they're fully aware of, um, of everything that is happening to them. And they do have the mental capacity to participate in treatment, to, you know, to engage, right? Um, so for the most part, for you guys, that's usually all you're gonna be looking at. The mental status exam, um, so you may get some grief from LPHAs because the mental status exam can be very, is a very formal thing um, that's usually done by a mental health clinician. However, for what we've been talking about this semester for you guys, you guys should be looking at your clients like this all the time. You know, are they present, <laughs> right? Is, is Johnny here with me, right? Does Johnny understand what's going on? 
right? Um, and if there's any change, if you're, if you're noting that, which is why we put it in our, our burp notes, if there's any change, then you have a history. No, Johnny's always oriented times four. Today he was oriented by two. He knew his name um, and he knew he was in Santee, but why he was here, he just seemed really lost, seemed kind of like out of it, right? So, um, so that would be important to note. Does that make sense? Um, mental health clinician might uh, do what's called serial sevens, might, uh, which is where you count backwards from 100 by seven. Um, might have uh, uh, an individual um, give them four words and then go on with the rest of the assessment and then come back to it like 10 or 15 minutes later and say, hey, what were those four words, right? Um, the other thing a, a mental health clinician may do is uh, have them draw certain objects. Um, and part of that is, as Judy was saying earlier, as far as mental capacity, if there's any um, cognitive, serious cognitive issues going on, having them draw a clock, for instance, and if they're able to do that or not, right? So they'll do that for like, you know, for dementia, dementia patients and things like that. For substance use counselors, for what you guys do, you don't have to go all that far. That's what the mental health clinician is for. You're just looking at, are they oriented times four? Are they alert? Um, and that's what you're looking at. So does that make sense? And um, I actually wanted to look at the, I'm gonna go look at the exam question for that. So I may come back um, to this a little bit later on and make sure that we've covered how it will be presented on the exam. Which by the way, some of these questions on the exam is actually might look like a little bit of a scenario. Like they may say, Johnny is a 35 year old um, uh, Caucasian, um, divorced, uh, heterosexual male um, who recently started drinking, right? Uh, and he comes into your situation, into your program and he's reported uh, drinking issues. He's reported some health issues and he's reported some uh, EBT, I mean, not EBT, sorry, EBC. Um, <laughs> emotional, uh, behavioral, or cognitive uh, dimension three issues, right? Um, and then that scenario may ask a question about treatment planning, for instance, like which one might you tackle first? Or in an assessment, you know, um, which would be the best answer? Uh, you know, it'll ask you a question, right? So some of the questions on the exam will have like a brief scenario, and then they'll ask a question or two based on that. So just be aware of that. Some are just straight out true or false, right? Some are multiple choice, uh, whether all, if it's not true or false, it's all multiple choice, um, but it might be a straight out multiple choice uh, question, right? So suicide or, um, uh, questions include all of the following except, right? And by the way, when you're looking at your exam, remember to read the question carefully because which one is not included or which one is included, two different types of answers you're gonna come up with if you read that too fast and misunderstand the question. So just, just read the question carefully and then answer it. So, all right, let's go on to the next slide. Now this big slide here uh, is a bulk of a lot of things that you're gonna see on the exam. We've already talked a little about, about um, ASAM level of care, and we've hit on it throughout the semester here and there. Um, but I just want you to have a basic understanding of ASAM uh, levels of care. And so um, using the raised hand feature, uh, is there anyone that would like to um, talk about a couple of the level of cares? Not all of them, because we'll give other people a, a chance to talk about them too. So give me a couple of them. Like, for instance, who knows what ASAM LOC 0 0.5 is? What is that? Renee, what is that? And you're on mute. Or you froze. I can't tell. Or I froze. 
No, I did. It's my mute button. Oh. Um, it's low intensity outpatient. A actually, um... that's not it. I know that's not it. <laughs> I can tell you what 3.1, 3.3, 3.5 <laughs> That's good. Well, I'll save those for you. Okay, how's that? Uh, okay. Um, uh, Paul, I saw your hand. What is uh, ASAM level of care 0 0.5? That'd be early intervention. That would be early intervention, right? So if somebody comes in and they screen at a 0.5, they're really, at this point, they're really not eligible for any kind of treatment program, are they? Right. Um, it's not saying that they don't need some help. So we might refer them to some early intervention type programs that are out there, maybe, you know, family health centers or some of those other places that have some of those kinds of services. All right. Um, what is a uh, ASAM level of care 1.0? Uh oh, hold on one second. Siri. All right. Sorry about that. So 1.0, what is, what is that? And what does it entail? Dominic. Is that for outpatient services? That is for outpatient services, right? So on average, do you know how many hours a week an individual in an OS would be engaged? Roughly? Ms. Is Juanita? It, oh, go ahead, Dominic, go ahead. Is it nine? Uh, actually, that's your, you're heading up toward intensive outpatient at that point. Okay. Yeah. So it's about five hours, roughly. Yeah, about five hours a week of some kind of involvement. Intensive outpatient, which is 2.1, I'm just gonna go ahead and give that one away. Um, since uh, Dominic helped me roll right into that one, um, is, is like nine hours, like we do nine hours a group, and then they have individual, um, you can go above the minimum. So like a person in outpatient could do more than five hours in a week. A person in intensive outpatient could do more than nine hours in a week. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of our clients actually do do more than that. Um, especially in the very beginning, and then it kind of settles off. Um, so, but that's usually the difference. And of course, uh, they have their own residence, or maybe they're living in a sober living environment, something like that. But uh, but it's non residential. All right, um, Miss Renee, you want to go ahead and 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 tackle uh, three point one, three point three, three point five. Okay, so 3.1 is, clin is uh, clinically managed low intensity residential treatment. 3.3, um, well, we don't really use 3.3, but 3.3, um, I want to say moderate, but I think that's 3.5. It's also medically managed. So there has Medi to be. Yes, medically managed. Right. So there has to be some kind of medical. Um, interventions happening there right right um and and right so and that's really the difference when you get above 3.1 that's really where we're talking about right yeah, uh, with 3.3 and then 3.5 is high intensity residential right. treatment Does, right isn't there 2.5 partially hospitalized uh there is but i didn't throw it on here it's not on the exam okay. and there's i think that's really kind of one of the holes in our system here in san diego anyway i'm not familiar with any i know that there are some people that do php um, but i just can't list them off the top of my head i know jackson house does ah see learn something new tonight all right um oops i see my i have hit something hold on sorry about that okay here we go i accidentally changed the slides all right and then 4.0 you had somebody that's 4.0, that is, that is some intense uh, situation. Um, all right, trans theoretical model of change. So hopefully these will be some easy questions for you. We've done a lot of work on TTM this semester and 
motivational interviewing and knowing the stages of change, right? Um, but let's talk about uh, uh, the stages of change. So what, in my lecture, I specifically said that something was not a stage of change, although it gets, it's, it's lumped in with the TDM, TTM, but it is not a stage of change. Go ahead, uh, Judy. Relapse. Relapse, exactly. Relapse is not a stage of change. Um, uh, also termination, which is the most uh, recent adaptation from, from um, their work early on, <coughs> which comes after maintenance. Um, I've seen it listed as a stage of change. I've seen it listed as an event, um, but this is how I look at it. And this is how I'll be teaching. Relapse is not a stage of change and neither is termination. If you terminate, you're done, right? The change is instilled, it's you're done, right? Um, the stages of change that we are talking about that we've focused on this semester, there are five of them. What are they? Use your raise hand feature guys. or chat. Uh, Judy. Um, you are on mute. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Yep, that is correct. That is correct. And then Dominic, I saw your hand. Uh, yeah, um, Judy got me first. It's okay. That's okay. So, so I'll give you a little bit chance. So, what does pre-contemplation mean? Um, not planning to change. Not planning to change. Exactly. They don't see, think they have a problem. I'm good. That DUI, that was the cop's fault. They're just out to get me, right? I'll solve that problem. I'll just sell my car and move next to the bar, right? That is a person who is pre-contemplative, right? Very good. All right. What about contemplation? This can be Dominic or anyone. What is contemplation? Thinking about change. Yeah, the person is thinking about change, but there's something that um, that I always identify and I always say, this is the hallmark of contemplation. You know you have contemplation when this is happening with an individual. Um, Juanita, do you know? Somebody just put it up in the words, <laughs> a good oh, word. Did they? Oh, yeah, but I'm, and they said ambivalent, but I was going to say um, that they're noticing that they have reason for change, but has not agreed to it yet. Right. And what you said is correct. And Michaela, that is exactly the word I was looking for. Ambivalence. If you're, if you're talking with a client and they're giving you change talk and sustained talk, they're experiencing ambivalence, right? So they are not in preparation. They are in contemplation, right? Once they resolve that ambivalence, once their sustained talk kind of starts to go away and they've made a decision, okay, I need to change. Now they're in preparation. What is the action stage? What does that mean? Go ahead, Judy. And you're on mute. Is it when the client is taking steps towards the change and they're doing things that implement change, like no longer hanging out at old places, talking to old people, and doing the same things that they used to do when they were in active addiction? Yes and no. That's a real, I really like your answer, but it gives me an opportunity to kind of parse some things out. So when a person has resolved their in, uh, ambivalence and they've moved into preparation, they may start to make some little changes. They may start experimenting with changes. They may go to an AA meeting or a, or a CMA meeting or an NA meeting, right? Um, they may start formulating plans. Maybe they're calling around and um, uh, looking at 
outpatient treatment programs, for instance. So they're, they're taking little steps, they're taking some actions, but that in and of itself doesn't put them in the action stage just yet, right? So preparation is also where they're making their plans, right? And then they decide what they're going to do. Action means that they have started working on their plan, be, um, begun more serious steps into uh, making these changes, and that they've been doing this for at least six months, right? So, um, so it's, it, it does get a little murky between the line between preparation and action, um, because you can see some things happening in the preparation stage that may continue in the action stage. And I hope that makes sense. But in the action stage, it's more solidified. They're doing more um, actions around that, right? Um, and they're maintaining their plan, they, you know, so. Um, all right. And what about maintenance? What does maintenance look like? Maybe someone I haven't heard from for a little while. Let's see. Really? Nobody knows? Ah, Paul, go ahead. Maintenance is when they've, you know, they have changed the behavior they are no longer using. They are, uh, you know, actively engaged in their recovery. So they may have completed a treatment program, but they're still engaged in step or recovery services or smart recovery or some other active um, participation to, to remain in recovery and to keep abstaining. Right, very good. You know, in action stage, that's when relapse prevention planning begins. Um, maintenance is when relapse prevention is actually happening, right? They're engaging that behaviors to prevent relapse. Um, and, um, and it becomes basically a new way of life at that point. Um, and then, and then depending on how long they're doing that move into termination and, and they're done. In other words, those changes are now complete, right? Now relapse, as I've already said before, is not a stage of change. Um, relapse also cannot happen if somebody is pre-contemplated. That's, even if they've stopped, they're in pre-contemplation, they've stopped using for whatever reason, maybe they were forced to, maybe they had an ultimatum from a family member, whatever it is, but they don't believe they have a problem. Uh, and then they start using again. Technically, that's not a relapse. It's just continued use with a break, <laughs> if that makes sense, right? I would even argue that someone who is contemplative, um, because a person can be thinking about change in contemplation, but still using, by the way, so, um, so just because they're in contemplation doesn't mean they've stopped using, okay? Um, so relapse really can't happen there either if they're still using, right? That's not, that's not a relapse, that's continued use, right? Relapse gets called relapse once they've actually implemented some changes and made a decision to change. They've resolved their ambivalence, they've recognized the problem, um, and now they're implementing a plan and then they have a recurrence and a recurrence might be one-time use and then they come back. That was another word for that is lapse, right? Even that is not a relapse, okay? Um, a recurrence is not equal to a relapse. Now a recurrence can turn into a relapse, can't they? What's the definition of relapse? Returning to full active use and addiction. Yes, very good. And Richard, you had your hand up. Go ahead with your definition. Oh, sorry. Going back to that same lifestyle okay. and actions of the addiction. Exactly. And clinically, the definite, you both are correct. Absolutely correct. Clinically, the definition is a return to a previous diseased state, <laughs> right? That's the clinical definition, right? So um, active addiction, I think we can all agree, is, is a diseased state, according to um, the DSM-5, right? So that's what it is. A recurrence 
doesn't necessarily mean that they've returned to that diseased state. It just means that they've used. And whereas that can be part of the process, right? They may learn something from that. You know, a good example of that is like, oh my God, you know, I got mad at my wife and then, you know, we had a fight and I went to the bar and I was just so mad and I drank and then I went, what am I doing? And then I called my sponsor right away and we went to a meeting together. Yeah, that person had a re recurrence. That's not a relapse. Now in the rooms, they'll call it a relapse. This is where it gets murky. And so um, the reason why I'm, I'm, I really harp on it here is because um, I know a lot of people here have lived experience and they have lived experiences through the 12 step rooms where relapse means one thing and only one thing where clinically that's not true, right? So, um, um, so just kind of want to highlight that. And I try to educate my clients on that because here's what happens with relapse or the, or this, you know, I, you get somebody that comes in and says, oh, I'm a chronic relapser. No, you're not a chronic relapser. You're in active addiction. You're in continued use, right? Um, let's take some of the shame and the stigma out of that, right? Um, anyway, uh, let's see. And then uh, Maria, yes, yeah, so work to sustain, sustain sobriety is, is uh, maintenance, exactly, yeah. All right, um, what is the definition of comorbidity. Jules. It's the, um, it is two or more uh, illnesses or co-occurring disorders that affect health and it is 60% of those within substance abuse. Yes, you said within health or did you say mental health? Well, it is mental health. It affects the health because the drug abuse. Oh, you froze. Okay, just, yes, just, if we're just addressing the drug abuse and it is mental health, it's not health, sorry. Yeah, okay, right. So when, when for purposes of what we're doing here, um, you know, co-occurring in the medical world means you have two, two things happening at the same time. When it comes to um, substance use disorder treatment, Substance use disorder is one of the uh, disorders and then any other diagnosable DSM-5 um, mental health concern is the other. So you have a substance use disorder and um, anxiety, substance use disorder and PTSD, substance use disorder and general anxiety disorder are de uh, clinical depression, right? So those two things are happening at the same time. Um, and yes, you are correct. 60% of individuals that come into treatment have a co-occurring disorder. So we should always be uh, expecting that. When we see our clients, um, we should be expecting that there's probably a co-occurring disorder going on, which is why we do assessment to either rule it in or rule it out, right? Our, and I see a chat. So, yes, when two um, disorders or in, uh, illnesses occur simultaneously in the same person, great definition. Uh, but I do, again, I just want to focus, remember for here, for us, it's one of them has to be an SUD and then whatever else is going on, okay? Um, all right. And then um, let's talk about consultation. You know what I always say, actually, I stole it from Teresa Whitney, but I always say it now too. I just give her credit. Um, seek supervision before supervision seeks you. <laughs> it's a very, um, very important piece of advice. All right, so let's, uh, let's see. So what is um, consultation? When's it needed? What are the circumstances? With whom is it conducted? Let's, let's talk about some examples.
All right. Well, one example I kind of I'll I'll help get the uh, the juices flowing here with with the cognitive processes um, supervision, right? So, what if you're having um, countertransference with a client, right? That would be an example of you probably need to seek some supervision and some consultation on how to handle that. So what is countertransference? Go ahead, Renee, I see both of your hands. Uh, countertransference is when you are, um, you are taking on their feelings um, and it's, and it's uh, fogging, you know what I'm saying? It's, and it's affecting your judgment. Uh, yes, that's one way of looking at that. Exactly. Right. Um, another way of looking at that is they're not doing what I'm telling them to do. Right. right? So you're getting some, you know, uh, they're being um, uh, resistant. Right. You, you start finding yourself using those types of terms or thinking about um, clients in that way or going, oh, God, I got in an hour. I've got to meet with with Johnny and I really just don't want to meet with him. Right. Um, you're probably experiencing some, some level of countertransference. And that's on the negative side. On the, um, well, can I say, because I look at last week, I had that countertransference talking to somebody on the phone that was totally, totally loaded. So I thought, right? Because that's how they were sounding. So when they came in for an intake, I already had in my mind that they were high because they came in the next day, right? And I, I mean, I literally had to sit back and because it wasn't, he just had a mental health problem. Right. Right. right? It had nothing to do with what I thought. Right. So, and so, so I had to talk to my supervisor about how I felt. Right. And here's the thing. You learn something from that, right? right. So Absolutely. you do, you do a phone screening. And the person is slurring their voice or, or slurring their speech or having, you know, or, or some of the stuff that they're saying may seem nonsensical to you, right? Right. Um, and, and the assumption might be, oh, this person is, oh, they're high. They're not being serious. Or maybe they're playing a joke on me or, right? So we, we if we're going in that direction, then they come in and we realize, no, this person has a dimension three situation happening here, right? Right. Um, and uh, so that was a, a very good learning experience, right? Absolutely. To be a little bit more blank screened with someone, right? And just not make assumptions all the time. And, and, believe, and thank you for sharing that um, uh, because that's part of all of our learning processes. Um, I've done that. We all make assumptions. And guess what? We all have countertransference every single one of us. Um, it's just that, do, uh, do we let it affect what we're doing with our clients? And if we are, then that's a problem. The other side of countertransference, so usually when we talk about countertransference, we're talking about the, the negative kind, the, the angry kind, the, uh, the, the um, uh, distressing type. But then there's also the other side of countertransference where you just love your client oh, my client is doing everything so well, right? Um, and the risk there is, is that we may miss something because we think our client is doing very well, right? I always, um, uh, one of the things I always say with our, uh, with our counselors where I work, I've actually everywhere I've ever worked is, so why is that client doing so well? If you can't answer that question or they can't answer the question, it's time to examine that and make sure that our assessment is correct. Um, because if we have this halo effect, which is what that is called, by the way, it's a type of countertransference. Um, if we have a halo effect on our client, they might skate through the program. Uh, they may program very well. And within 24 hours, they're, they're loaded again because something got missed, right? So we wanna be careful about positive feelings for our clients and negative feelings for our clients, right? We just wanna, we wanna be honest in our assessments of not only our own position, but of where our clients are as well. So that's one example. What would be um, um, 
another example of when consultation might be needed. And with whom? My hands up. Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. So maybe if you have, um, so you come in and then all of a sudden it's your cousin that's coming into treatment mm -hmm. or your best friend. You need to let somebody know that you, you know what I'm saying you have a re you've had a relationship of some sort outside the program with this person. Yes. You need to take it to your supervisor. Yes, you definitely would need to do that. That would be another reason for consultation. Um, that's another reason. Um, Richard, I see your hand. For me, being new in this, it would be if I'm not completely certain about something, I need to find out how it's done. Right. That's another another good thing, right? So you're doing counseling with clients or groups with clients and a situation comes up and you're not sure how to handle it. You know what? Exactly. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so you can consult with a supervisor. You may not need a supervisor for that. You might, depending on your level of certification. If you're an RADT, I always recommend talking with your supervisor, but you can also talk to like the LPHA. You can talk to the lead counselor as well, right? Uh, who may not be your supervisor, but um, right? So collaboration not only includes supervision, but it also includes, I mean, did I say collaboration? Sorry, I meant to say consultation. Consultation not only includes supervision, which is clinically relevant, especially for new, uh, new counselors, but it's also for any treatment things that come up or a, or a unique situation that you haven't dealt with before, right? Um, that you might need assistance with what intervention would work for this or uh, the client isn't following the rules. So what do we need to do here? Like how can we encourage the client to, um, to be treatment adherent, right? Uh, and that might mean that they get some kind of, you know, if we're looking at operant conditioning, for those who knows what, what that is, right? Positive or negative reinforcement, positive or negative punishment, right? To try to encourage um, appropriate behavior, right? So you may want to have some consultation uh, to determine the best interventions. And there's a couple of chats, let's see. Ah, consultation could be needed if you are unsure whether you need to make a mandated report. Absolutely. That's another good reason uh, where consultation um, could come into that. Any other thoughts on consultation? All right, and uh, let's see. Um, all right, let's move on to the next slide. Let's talk about uh, case management and service coordination. So, um, yeah, let's talk about case management. What is that? What is case management? Oh, Judy, I see your hand. I thought Manil had her hand up. I just read, I don't know. So did you want to answer the question or? Yeah, I'll go. Yeah. Um, so case management is when, so the case manager is the person that the clients would go to when they have, so for example, residential treatment, when they have needs or they need community resources and they need to be, um, not warm handoff, but they need links. It's links, services. They link a lot of uh, the clients to services that the client would need if they need medical treatment, if they need to find a place to get treatment for hep C, if they need to know where to get HIV treatment, tuberculosis testing, uh, even down to getting the free government phones or finding free diapers, or in our case, sometimes middle, our case manager helps assist with housing links and things like that. Yes, um, and you kind of hit on some of the focus for that, right? Um, which is uh, very, very true there. Um, like, uh, like HIV, hep C, housing, all, all of those things. Um, let's see here, oops, sorry. Um, 
Ah, crap. So another word, because you used a word that's very important, um, Judy, and that's linkage, um, right? Which is definitely uh, one of those words that um, I want you guys to remember. And um, also um, coordination, right? So um, goes along with that. Service coordination is coming up next. Uh, but in case management, we're coordinating those available resources. We're linking those available resources. And you did a really good job on, on the focus. And then Judy, I see your hand is still up. Did you have something else? Okay. And then uh, um, Emma, did you have your hand up? I, I put it, I, I was up a little late. I was gonna say um, on, the, on the other, um, question um i know i have asked for help uh, when it came to medications okay so going back to i'm just going to pop back here for a minute you're talking about consultation right yes sir yeah yes, sir. yeah right so um client presents with certain medications and and of course that's outside your scope so naturally you would definitely need to consult on that exactly and so, and that's another good rule of thumb right and um you know, understanding what our scope of practice is and uh, where, where we can operate independently and where we cannot, right? Right. There you go. Thank you. Sorry, I missed your hand earlier. All right. So let's talk about um, service coordination in and of itself. And this also was on in the reading um, and um, on one of your homework assignments, too. So Obviously, you can tell I want to kind of drill this in. Um, what's one way that we can enhance service coordination? And then just hit the raised hand feature, or you can type it in chat. Oh, Judy, yes. Um, so I think I might be wrong, but was it building rapport with the person that we're working with to do the coordination of services? Um, yeah, no, that would not be service coordination in the way that we're talking about it. But certainly we want to be building that rapport and also being transparent and educating our clients. Okay, so this is where I would like to link you. Um, and this is why I would like to link you. This is what I'm thinking. So yes, having that rapport and, and being transparent with our clients is very important. But when it comes to service coordination, uh, rapport is not the answer for that. That's a, but good, good, uh, good job. Uh, and then Juanita, I see your hand, and then Richard and then Jewel. So we're gonna go in that order. Engaging the client and letting the client set uh, their goals. Uh, no, that would not be it either. So okay. here, let's let's, solve a little bit of confusion. Service coordination, yes, it involves the client, but it's not what you're doing directly with the client. Uh, and Jules. Jules, you're on mute if you're trying to talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said it helps to implement the plan. It also um, works to um, establish actions to enable the client to, to achieve their goals. They also advocate for the client and work with case managers. Yes. So you're talking about what case management does. Um, well, so I'm glad we're talking about this, right? So this seems to be a little bit of a, of a sticky thing. So let me hear from Richard and then, and then I'll talk more about it. How's that? Oops. To sum, uh, to sum it up a little differently, to get the different programs to work together at the same project. Yes, exactly. So where the other answers were involving the client, yes, we absolutely are working with the client on this. But when it comes to service coordination, it's how am I working with the other agencies in order to have this wraparound services? So I actually need to have rapport with the other agencies, right? Um, I need to be able to know who to call and all that kind of stuff. 
The other thing that the book talks about that's really, really important uh, that makes this suggestion. And this suggestion is really important, but it's also very diff difficult to implement, but I still want you guys to be aware of it. The best way to enhance service coordination is actually visit the facilities where you're making referrals to. Go and talk to that staff, look and see what they're doing, because when you have a better understanding of, of, of what's happening there, you're gonna make better referrals. Um, and then they do the same thing, right? There's that exchange of, of information. And so the book really talked about enhancing those services <clears throat> by getting involved with um, you know, those agencies where we're frequently re referring people. I'll give you an example. My program, we refer a lot of people to CRASH, right? So I've been to CRASH, I've been to all three houses. I've talked to counselors there. Sometimes I run into other students there. Um, I've even been to their Christmas parties, right? Um, their, uh, their holiday celebrations, right? And so um, that, believe it or not, participating even in those things um, enhances service coordination because I can pick up the phone and go, hey, Renee, this is what I got going on. What do you think, right? Do you guys have a bed? Will this work, you know? Um, and I'm picking on Renee. I'm trying to think who else I've talked to in this classroom this semester doing referrals for my program. Um, but that's, that's what it's about, right? Um, and so my hope one day is to get around to like all the programs. Like I haven't been to Kiva yet. Um, I would like to go visit Kiva. Um, but I've been to Pathfinders. I've been to Freedom Ranch. I've been to Stepping Stone. I've been to... Um, uh, crash, like I said before, I've been to Turning Point Home. Um, I've been to uh, oh, um, the way back, right? So, and that's me taking that time to go and look at these facilities. And, and that really helps to enhance that. So when you see the question on the exam and you see the word enhanced, I want you guys to think about, I'm making personal visits there and I'm getting to know this program on a, on a, on a real level. All right, so advocacy um, was mentioned earlier. Um, and part of case management, part of service coordination does involve ad advocacy, but what else, what else are we doing when, when it comes to advocacy? Any thoughts, Emma? Speaking on behalf of our client. Yes, in, for instance, in what way? Can you give me an example? So again, with medication, we, uh, we've come across, because we have to take them for withdrawal medications down at the, at the hospital. And um, we sent them with uh, uh, MAT services for them uh, for the last day used, what they used, um, stuff like that. Because a lot of times they're very intoxicated and under the influence and cannot make too much sense. Therefore, we would walk them in, make that contact with, with the, um, the staff on duty there and, and let them know and then give them the paperwork along with our phone number for them to call us to come back to pick them up. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank yeah, you. That's a good example. Um, Judy, I see your hand. Um, I've advocated for a client before as a, well, acting as a case manager. Um, where it was part of a CFT meeting and the client was trying to reestablish visitation with their minor child. And I advocated for them to be able, I was spoke up for the client because it was something that I was aware of. And I asked the CF, in the CFT meeting, I asked the CWS worker if there's any way that the client's minor child before they do the transition or before the transition is basically pushed for the minor child to be able to visit with their paternal family. Yeah. Um, prior to all the other X, Y, and Zs needed to be dots, everything else being done. That way they could have visitation sooner. Okay, that's another good example. Yeah, um, Richard. Would advocacy also be under service coordination? I call ahead to another facility to see if they have any beds, any other facilities that'll fit what we're trying to coordinate. Yes, and, and yes, it could do that, yes, yes. 
Who was talking about the PO earlier? Was that? Oh, was that it was you, me? Judy? Oh, oh there, was a Judy. Couple, there was a couple people that was talking about POs. Okay, so I asked both of you PO people. What might advocacy include with an individual who's on probation or, or uh, who's on probation in your program? Would it be having to advocate for the client based on their progress and treatment, reporting back mm -hmm. to the PO to change their level of probation, whether okay. it's formal or informal? Okay. Um, you could certainly advocate for a change in level of care, which may impact their probation. I don't know if you could advocate for a change in their probation, right? So, uh, but you could certainly advocate for a, um, uh, a change in their level of care and, and progress, right? Um, what do you think, Paul? And then I see two other hands. I'll, I'll get to you guys here in just a second. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that, like change in level of care for sure. Um, it could also be like in the past I've advocated with POs for clients to get like a, uh, a weekend pass to travel with family for an event or something like that. Um, sometimes I'll provide like a progress update if a, if a client has a trip or a wedding or something that they want to attend and I feel they're in a place where it's safe to do so. I may provide a progress update to the PO in the hopes that that will help get them the, the uh, clear to travel out of the county. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's another good example of advocating uh, for your client. Uh, I'm going to read a chat real quick, and then I'll come to Emma and then Renee. So um, Alvin wrote, uh, how about ensuring the client's personal rights are supported and accommodated, for instance, Spanish speaking material for Spanish readers? And yes, advocacy would certainly include that too. Um, making sure that, uh, that the services that they are receiving are such that are helpful, <laughs> right? That they're able to understand uh, and fully access whatever services they need. Um, so that's a good point. Go ahead, uh, Emma. Yes, we had a, um, a situation where a client, I remember before you had said that um, just because residential works for us doesn't mean it's gonna be working for everybody. So I, I'd use that in, uh, with one of their clients and um, told her to show, um, think of things that have worked for her instead of things that haven't worked for her. And um, we so we um, went with her doing an outpatient program when her PO turned around and called in and talked to case manage, management. She wanted to do a residential, started cussing her out. She wanted to take off to TJ and, and all this. And then when it all boiled down to it, um, the PO did say, that um, it would all depend on what the case manager would suggest for her to do. So just on uh, being the advocate for the client. Yeah, that's another, another good example, right? Um, and also involves probation. Um, and I'm kind of glad we're on this because the next thing we're gonna talk about here in just a second is gonna involve criminal justice uh, clients um, too. So I'm glad we're kind of on that. Renee, I see your hand. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe this would go into the next one is like from our, <coughs> our federal pretrial clients, you know, saying we've gone to court and advocated for them. Okay. On their it, sentencing dates, you know, and shown their progress that they have been there. But, you know, we personally go to those court dates. Yeah. As opposed to just sending a letter with them. Right, right, right. Let me ask you guys this. What if the client is not making progress? What if they are being disruptive? What if um, their adherence is subpar? What does advocacy look like then? Renee. So we just had an incident last week um, with a client who just wasn't complying, wanted to do her own way. Um, so, you know, we called the PO and said, look, you know, this is what we're, we'll do, but this is what we won't do either, right? So you need to make a choice. Do you want to take them back into custody? And it just happened to be one of your people. <laughs> um, really? Yeah. Nah. Yeah, one of your people, you know? Yeah. And, and 
And the bottom line is if that, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, we give them to a, a come, we, before we even call you guys, we give them a come into Jesus moment, right? Mm -hmm. Say, look, this is what's going on. Do, you know what I'm saying? We'll, we're going to put you on these tools. And if you accept it, you know what I'm saying? Then we'll let you stay. But if you don't want to do what we're asking of you, right? Then, you know, you might as well just go back. And um, we had to call you and you guys sent your guys and they came and got her. Yep. You know, but we have, you know, it, whether it's good or bad, if they're not, if, I mean, if they're there just to take up a seat, like we're not okay with that. Yeah. And, and really, and no, and I get that. The, um, the point of advocacy is, is that, you know, we often um, think of all of the good stuff that we were just talking about. I'm going to go to court and advocate for the, for my client's sentence to be reduced, or I'm going to um, advocate for, you know, their, their, to have visitation with their children, right? A lot of times we think advocacy is only about positivity, right? Um, and it's not. Advocacy can also include recommending sanctions if that is what is needed in order to assist a client um, to make progress, right? Um, you know, if we look at uh, dimension three, right, issues, oftentimes people say, think dimension thing in three, and they think, you know, emotional or mental health concerns, but it's also behavioral. So if you have an individual that is engaged in behavioral issues, um, which is why we send them to crash, by the way, boom, 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 um, <laughs> because of behavior modification, but that's what we're looking for. And behavior modification for a client, the client themselves may not enjoy it. Um, but we're advocating for the best type of treatment or operant conditioning situation to actually help them make progress and, and move forward, right? So, um, so recommending a custodial sanction may be uh, something we have to advocate for. I've done that. Um, I've had to advocate for um, public work service, right? As a, <clears throat> as a form of... Um, positive punishment for behavior issues, right? And that's where they have to go pick up trash along the side of the road, right? Things like that. Um, because then the later on, the client comes back and they go and they make improvements or they go, you know what? That was the best thing that I, ever happened to me. I had a wake up call, right? So, um, so I don't want you guys to always think advocacy is just about the good stuff or the pleasant stuff. Sometimes our advocacy is unpleasant. Like I don't ever want to send a person to jail, but there might be a situation where that's the best thing, right? Okay, go to jail for 24 or 48 hours because of this behavior or, you know, whatever. I, and I hope that makes sense. So what is, a, oh, uh, Juanita, I see your hand. And I forgot. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. We were we were talking yeah, about advocacy or criminal justice. Yeah, we were talking about advocacy, and you were saying, um, and she was explaining how she did things, and I kind of thought of the word contingency, but um, I was just and the rest I forgot. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, what's important for um, for counselors to know about criminal justice clients? What's important to know? Uh, Judy, go ahead. The type of crime committed? No, actually, that's probably not the, the most important thing to know. I mean, you might want to know that, obviously, and you're going to know it um, because of, uh, of screening intake assessment. You're going to get that information. But what do, you, what do you think it's, you know, when you're working with a criminal justice client, what do you think is important for you to know? Uh, Jules. They're very manipulative. That okay. was one of our test questions in the beginning of the year. Well, I don't think the answer was they're manipulative. I try not to be. <laughs> well, that I try, was in the book because I remember that I, question. I, I try actually. to be more. 
No, in the book it stated that, that that is the one thing they, that they're manipulative. Yeah. They can be manipulative. So so you need to read past because I know the paragraph you're talking about. So read past the manipulation. And so how do you need to address that? Emma. When you need to contact the, the um, a report on them. Okay, so going back to advocacy, yes, that, that, that might be um, uh, very true. But I'm talking about specifically when you're working with the client. So I have Johnny, he's on my caseload. He's got a long prison history, he's on probation. When I'm working with him, what do I need to know to, in order to work with him? What's the most important thing? Um, Paul. I don't know if this would necessarily be the most important thing, but one thing I always keep in mind working with people that are in the criminal justice system is that or legally involved is that they've, they've likely had very likely had trauma. Oh, wow. uh, and they are quite likely, especially if they've served hard time, they're going to be institutionalized, which can sort of change my approach with how I do things like remind them about meetings, give them very specific tasks, because they sort of need that structure, at least in my limited experience. Um, yes, and, and you are on the right track. And what you're describing here is, is that you can consider criminal justice clients as coming from their own unique culture. So having that, that cultural awareness of what it's like to be institutionalized. And yes, you're right about trauma. Um, so obviously you wanna use a trauma-informed care approach. Um, haven't quite hit on what I'm looking for just yet, but you, you guys are, all of these things are correct for this, um, but there's something specific I'm looking for. So Katrina, what say you? Want, uh, um do all of what he said on top of also introducing yourself and maybe earning their trust so they can open up a little bit because right off the bat um they're not going to want to talk to you they're not going to want to tell you anything they're just going to want to do what they got to do to get out of there so if they're going to be closed up then they're not going to be able to get in any help yeah and you are you are getting warmer. You're getting warmer. All right, Richard, and then Jewel. So Richard? Uh, to be cautious and don't put too much of my personal self out there because they'll take that information. Well, that is true. They, they will use that. So um, I'm uh, always one for, remember we've talked about self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna digress just for a minute. Self-disclosure is not on this exam. And so it's not on here, but I do want to send you away out of this semester knowing that self-disclosure should be very limited and in use and should have a very specific purpose, right? So please don't leave with your sobriety date, right? Um, or give out too much information because you're right. It may not be safe for you to do that with um, not just with criminal justice clients, but any of your clients really, right? So, um, all right. And Juanita. Oh, it's confidentiality, it? confidentiality. Well, confidentiality is important for every client. I so thought it was the one for, the, for, for criminal, I thought that was one of the things I read before was for the most important for, you know, criminal clients and also co-occurring confidentiality was one of the most important things, but. Yeah, so all of you guys are, are, are not wrong, right? You guys are all hopping around it, but here's what I am looking for. And Katrina, I, if memory serves me, came closest, right? She's talking about rapport and stuff. Here's what we need to do when we're working with criminal justice clients. You need to be transparent. They can smell BS a mile away, <laughs> right? So um, we need to be open, frank, straightforward, transparent, and have very clear boundaries. Um, I am paraphrasing what the book says. I don't know if it says it in all that way, uh, but transparency, uh, um, clear boundaries, um, uh, because, because the book does describe them as having a manipulative nature. Um, I just say they're just using their skills to have their needs met. Um, and 
<laughs> so we could call that manipulation. I'm going to be more positive and say they're just having their needs met. Um, but it's really important that, that we don't try to fake them out or BS them. We need to be transparent and have very clear boundaries and, and establish that, which actually goes back to the advocacy thing too. And that means if we are being that way and they're, and they're still engaging in unhelpful behaviors for their recovery, or it's adversely affecting other clients, then we may have to advocate for some type of sanction, whether it be with parole, probation, court, whatever it may be, um, that may be unpleasant for the client in, the, in that moment, right? So, all right, any questions on, on any of that? All right, and then suicidal assessment, I actually meant to delete that, so um, uh, we've already covered it. So we're going to go on to the to the next slide. And you know, when we're talking uh, on this slide, what I want you guys to be focused on um, for um, sorry, hold on one second. I'm uh, for documentation is uh, well. Let's talk about signatures. Um, so what does a signature look like on a signed note? What are the required elements? Paul. Your name and your credentials. <laughs> That's part of it. So name and credentials. Caitlin. Um, also the date. Yep, name, credentials, and date. And there's one more thing. Your action? Nope, nope, nope. Oh, let me see, there's chat. Let's see if it's there. Title. Um, Michaela says title, but there's something else that's missing. Is it the expiration of the consent? The consent form? Uh, nope. We're just talking strictly from your signature. I'm doing a clinical note, and at the end of the note, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna write my name, my credentials, initials. No initials. No. No. Date? No. No. <laughs> signature. Signature. Yes. So you need your name, your credentials, uh, your full signature and the date it was signed. Those are the required elements. The title is not required, although on some forms um, you'll see that there's a title there. But, um, but the California state standards, the DMC, ODS, uh, San Diego County is your printed name, your credentials, um, your uh, legal signature, and the date it was signed and it does have to be signed in blue or black ink. No pencil, no, none of that stuff, right? It can be assigned electronically if you have an EHR, as long as the county has approved your EHR, so. All right, Paul, question. Yeah, I was under the understanding you can only use black ink in San Diego County because I did a couple documents with blue ink and I did not hear the end of it for some time. That I will bet you did not hear the end of it because that's your boss's preference, but you can use blue or black. Oh, okay, thank you. Now, like I said, your boss's preference or the agency preference might be only black ink, right? Um, uh, but you could use blue or black according to the, to the standards. So. But always go with what your boss says. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, we've talked about um, documentation a lot this, sem this semester. What's the purpose? Why do we document? To back ourselves up on everything we do. Yeah, so that is, so that statement, um, whoever made it, sorry, I'm not sure who made it. Um, it was Amanda, sorry. Okay, Amanda. Yeah, that statement actually covers several different things, right? So we do it for funding purposes. We do it for legal purposes, right? Um, 
and and your statement would cover a, a cover those two things which may or may not be answers on the um, exam let's see here i got three chats and then two hands so uh one said billing purposes which is what i said um if it's not documented it didn't happen exactly so if you want to get paid you got to document it right so that's that funding sources that billing um, purpose um juanita what say you uh, it was already answered. I was going to say um, for payment. Okay. All right. Very good. And Emma, what say you? I was on the other question. I, I don't know why I'm just a little slow here, but I was going to say with the <laughs> with the blue and the black, you know, because I had asked that question. I, I'll always ask if I don't know, and even if I think it's a dumb question, but they said to show that it's not a copy. It's not Xerox. That's right. why they used the, the other color ink. And I was right. just like, that's pretty smart because I didn't know. Because yeah. actually that's that's what I do. I, I sign in blue myself. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's just my preference. I use black and blue depending on what it is. But my signature is always in blue, always. So, um, and that's my reasoning for it. Uh, Jules. How getting back to document. Um... You can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, I wasn't sure. Maybe I messed up on the button thingy again. I think I'm a little at the end of the semester. Um, but it's also to document uh, uh, progress and treatment goals that have been achieved or attained, and where it's a map. It's where else you're going. Exactly. It's also to document what hasn't been. So my client is making progress. My client is not making progress. Right. Um, it's also to document what we're doing about it. If a client isn't making progress, well, then what, what are we going to do, right? So we need to document that as well. Um, what about documenting HIV status? What's the law say? We can't state that they have HIV. We have to put it like as a chronic illness or uh, what is the exact way we put it? Um, yeah, or special medical circumstance. Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we can't state that the client has HIV. Yes. Um, so it cannot be written anywhere in the client's regular file, right? Um, uh, it can be in a file, in a more secure file, whatever that means, according to the book. Um, I guess that would be a, a file that wouldn't be subject to subpoena or um, anybody just looking at it but an individual's um, HIV status should not be documented in the regular file that a lot of different people have access to, like multiple counselors, billing clerks, things like that. Um, so uh, that's really important to note. All right, um, diagnosis. So what's included in a diagnosis? Juanita. Uh, criteria and categories. Um, uh, the, uh, um, gosh, don't tell me. Let, don't let tell me, me. No, hold on. Let me, oh, stop. There it is. Okay. let, let yeah. me stop you right where you're at. When I'm talking mm -hmm. about a diagnosis, I'm just talking about how it's written. If I'm, if I'm saying somebody has uh, a meth problem, how do I write that diagnosis? What's um, included? It's, it's, um, what's included in a diagnosis is, um, um, severe um, to moderate meth and uh, wait, don't tell me. Hold on. Um, severe to moderate uh, meth amphetamine uh, use. Wait, I forgot. I don't. It, All it's right, so common. hold. So hold that thought. Let me get a couple other people I, in. I know this by heart. I can't believe it. All right. Um, Let me get a couple other people in. Hold on. All right, uh, Renee, go ahead. So I would put 1520, F1520, client, uh, severe methamphetamine use disorder uh, in a controlled environment, meaning that he was in jail. Okay, so, so what I hear you saying, and um, Juanita, this will help you out a little bit, right? So when, you, when we're writing out a diagnostic label for someone, and when you think of the word label, those are actually, that's the words that are being used. So amphetamine type 
substance use disorder, comma, severe, comma, in a controlled environment. That's the label, right? So it includes the substance, it includes the continuum, and it includes a specifier. In this case, the specifier is in a controlled environment. The other specifiers might be um, in early remission, um, if they're between three months and 12 months of abstinence. In sustained remission, if, if they are 12 months or more abstinent, right? So that is how it's written. Now, um, you will not have to write a diagnosis in the exam. You just need to be able to recognize the importance on, on how a diagnosis is, is written. I will say this, in San Diego County, and, and I have not had a chance to grade your diagnostic summaries yet, so you haven't gotten any feedback on that yet. Um, but one of the things I will give you feedback is, did you label your diagnosis correctly? And um, in San Diego County, they have a very specific set of criteria. They actually put out a chart on how they want these things to be done. Now, you guys normally don't write because that's another thing in California is that you're not allowed to write out diagnoses, but you, it is within your scope of practice to diagnose someone with a substance use disorder. That's why we teach it. It will help you do your ASIs, which will help your LPHA, right? So I, that's why I teach this um, as thoroughly as I do, even though you're not gonna be writing DDNs, um, but you need to know the importance of it. Because if you're looking at documentation and you spot that it's written wrong, you need to tell somebody right away. Otherwise, guess what? You're gonna um, lose um, billing over that, believe it or not. That's how picky they get. So mm -hmm. your labels have to be correct. And you also need an ICD-10 code. So for um, amphetamine type substance use disorder, severe um, in a controlled environment, that would be F1521. F1521. One, I think, F21 point, uh, F15.21, and I think it's a one after that. Um, but, you know, so- No, the one is, I'm sorry, the one is only if it's in early remission or sustained remission. No, the second one. Oh, then I'm gonna shut up. Yeah, there's, you know, for the specifier, I can't remember what it is. So I just threw that in there. But yeah, otherwise it's just four numbers, right? One five dot two one for um, severe and in early remission. Yes, exactly. So, um, but that's what's expected in San Diego County. Are we expected to memorize the dots and the ones? No. Okay. All right. So, what are some pharmacological indicators? What are they? Withdrawal. Yep, that's one. Um, uh, withdrawal and um, cravings. No. Sorry, sorry to be so brusque. <laughs> it makes me think harder. Um, Michaela, what say you? Tolerance. Tolerance. Those are your pharmacological <laughs> indicators, right? So if they're experiencing tolerance, and if they are experiencing um, uh, withdrawal. Those are your two indicators. All right. So let's see here. Hold on a second. We're almost done. Um, I thought we'd be done a little bit sooner than this. So just bear with me. Um, we're going to end class early. So, Professor, did you, I know you did the DSM labels. You did the DSM SUD criteria. Did you state that? or? Was I writing when you said that part? Well, what is the criteria? Why? What's the purpose of the criteria? It's to determine the severity. Exactly. Yep. Okay. I get it. Okay. The criteria, you kind of combined them. Yeah, okay. I did. I kind of talked about them both at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So, Because <laughs> I was taking notes as you're doing this. So what's the criteria for mild? Uh, two to three. What's the criteria for moderate? Four to five. And what is the criteria for severe? Six up. Yeah. And Six do and we, above. yeah. And do we classify abuse versus dependence? 
Um, I'm not even going to try to pretend. Uh -huh. that right. <laughs> Do we classify abuse versus dependence? No. Uh, no. No, we do not. If you're classifying um, abuse versus dependence, you're in the DSM-4 TR, and you are out of date. <laughs> we no longer do that. All right. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Talk about treatment planning. Um, so who's involved? What's included? What do we do? The client's involved? Uh, yes, the client definitely has to have an involvement, right? This, this should be a collaborative effort. Exactly, right? Paul. Uh, so yes, the client's involved, the counselor obviously, possibly a case manager. Um, and the things you're doing is you're trying to figure out what the client wants to achieve out of treatment. Mm -hmm. and then establish goals and action steps and target dates based on the goals that they vocalize. Yeah. Very good. What about assessments? How does assessments play a role in treatment planning? Anybody? Um, assessments help you give you the um, guidelines to what you're going to treat. It's, gonna, it's, it's a um, set um, uh, information that you gather to uh, begin to create a treatment plan um for the client your your treatment plan is based on the assessment it gives you the goals that you can defines goals well it doesn't define the goals plan. it defines problems right problems. so when we're when we're and assessing we're, we're finding out well it not only does it define so assessment will give us a client's strengths and assessment will give us a client's weaknesses it will identify areas that they need support right so an assessment in and of itself isn't going to give you your goals. It's going to give you areas of focus. Okay. Right. Thanks. For treatment Thanks. planning. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about goals, that's when we're actually looking at our treatment planning um, and collaborating with the client. What is their, their goals? Right. Um, and as Michaela says, the LOC or the level of care, um, which you have to do, and this is not on the, on the exam, uh, but you have to do an ASAM level of care before you do a treatment plan where you're looking at each of the individual um, dimensions um, on where the person is, right? And so you're looking at that uh, and that will also drive treatment planning. All right, so let me ask, so here's an example. There is gonna be a scenario on the treatment plan I mean, on the exam. And um, I told you some of these are scenario based. You read a little scenario and then it's gonna ask you some questions based on the scenario. And so um, how do we prioritize what goes on the treatment plan? What's problem area number one? Substance disorder. Yeah, exactly. Um, Judy and Jules were coming in at the same time with that. It is substance use disorder, right? So um, that is problem area number one. What's problem area number two, generally, if a client has it? Co-occurring disorders. Um, biomedical. It's biomedical. You want to address any physical health things that are going to um, uh, interfere with their treatment or any serious health things. And then whoever said the co-occurring, that would also, that would be area number three on a treatment plan. Now, um, and then you can see here, right? Substance use, biomedical, any legal, psychosocial, educational. So if you're looking at education, employment, financial, um, all of that is dimension six areas, right? Um, psychosocial is dimension six. It's also dimension three. Biomedical is dimension two for ASAM. Um, substance use is dimension one and five, um, if we're looking at it in an ASAM criteria kind of way. But when you're doing treatment planning and your client presents with these problems, these, these, this is how it gets prioritized. And so this is one of those confusing things. This is how we teach it, right? Um, that your treatment plan problem area for sub, if you're a substance use disorder program always should be um, the substance use issue, 
should be number one because that's why they're there, followed by like biomedical and all the others. The reason why this gets confusing is because I already know, because I've, I've been doing this for a long time and I've interacted with lots of counselors and programs that not all programs do this in this way. Sometimes they'll put the physical exam first because they want them to get it done right away. Personally, to me, it's on the treatment plan. If it's number two, why aren't they getting it done right away anyway, right? So that's always been my question, but that's just a, a thing that I struggle with. Um, but technically in the state of California, there is no regulation that says what goes on the treatment plan in what order, right? So, so programs can do and order their treatment plans any way they want. I personally just don't think that that's a good idea. That's not how I was trained. That's not how we're trained. That's not how the, the, um, um, the uh, field is, right? Um, and so this is why I'm teaching it the way I am. That's why I'm gonna test on it. Um, but just know when you get out there, um, like at my programs, we do follow this, you know, and other programs that I've worked at, we've followed this but I know at some other programs, they don't. So just be aware, there's a little bit of difference out there in the real world. Um, and California doesn't regulate it. So there's no one would ever get in trouble for it. But for me, clinical best practice, defending what I'm doing, um, this is the prioritizing on treatment planning that I would take. And it's also in the book, so. Um, so I, I do kind of expect you guys to kind of have this basic framework in mind so that you can answer the question um, in the proper priorities. All right, and then uh, SMART goals. What does SMART stand for? Uh, Paul, and then Dominic. Okay, I can let Dominic take this one. I've talked a lot tonight. Okay, Go ahead, that Dominic. Good. Go ahead, Dominic. Oh, okay. Uh, this, this specific, measurable, attainable. Uh, I forgot what the R is, but I know the T is time bound. Yep. So you're you're good. Who has the R? Who knows what R is? Um, All right. Oh, I know. Uh, go ahead. It's um, attainable. I thought R you said you knew. <laughs> I thought I knew. I was looking, I wrote everything but the R down, sorry. <laughs> All right, so one answer, uh, Richard, what's your, what say you? Repeatable. Um, close. Realistic, it's realistic. It's relevant. realistic or relevant. Or uh, uh, okay. yeah. yeah, realistic or relevant, right? Um, I like to go with relevant. I forget exactly what the book says um, it, it, um, because if something is achievable, it's realistic. So that's why I kind of like the word relevant. Um, and T is time bound, right? So just be able, you just need to be able to recognize what isn't uh, um, one of the acronyms, right? So you'll be presented with some acronyms and and uh, or some answers for the acronym and you need to pick out the one that's not. Uh, T is time bound. So there has to be a time limit. All right, and then this is our last slide. Uh, actually, it's not. The next slide is what we've already done. We did this practice last week. Um, so I'm not gonna do it tonight. We're just gonna finish up with this last slide here uh, and I'm gonna let you go. Um, because you've written a total of four or five burp notes this entire semester. So um, I think you guys have got that. So let's talk about um, some miscellaneous stuff. So what do we do with client difficulties um, that are having difficulties with treatment, adherence, following the rules, participating in the activities? What are some things that we can do? Juanita. Behavior contract. Could do that. Contingency yeah. management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Personal enhancement agreement. Oh, I like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. The other thing we want to do is we want to make sure we're documenting what we're doing. Uh, and also going back to advocacy, uh, it may mean that we have, might have to recommend a sanction, you know, to help someone. Uh, all right, so what does research say as to treatment duration and individual versus group or what does research say? What did we talk about this semester? Jules. That it should be at least 90 days to be um, best effective. Exactly, so 90 days. Yep. And then what about in individual versus group or individual and group? Who knows that? Well, the research actually shows that a combination of individual and group is most effective, right? So we have the 90 day time period and then also using uh, individual sessions and group sessions. Um, there's going to be a question on um, uh, either APS or uh, CWS, right? Um, which obviously involves mandated reporting. So you're going to want to know um, or be able to recognize in the scenario type question on is this reportable and what, how, when do you report it, right? What's your responsibility? I will say one example of this would be, you know, if you have a reasonable suspicion, okay, reasonable suspicion that either an adult or a child or a dependent adult or whatever is at risk for abuse, that's all you need to make a report. You don't have to investigate it. You don't have to confirm it. You don't have to be certain, right? Um, but if you have a reasonable um, uh, belief that, that a child is, is you know, in danger then, um, or an adult, then, then you make that report. And there are time frames for that. Um, and you know, so you need to, for instance, for C CWS, you have to report it right ASAP and then fill out a re written report, I think within 24 or 48 hours, I forget exactly what it is, but that's not a test question. So you don't have to worry about it, but you have to follow up with a written report AS, I mean, within 24 or 36 hours, something like that. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll say about that is we always wanna consult uh, and then seek supervision too. You wanna get other people involved in this process. Um, not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but you will need to be able to recognize and choose out of a whole big list, the correct certifying bodies. You'll need to know and understand the four transdisciplinary foundation and the eight practice dimensions. Uh, and then what does substance use cost us each year? in these different areas, economic, medical, well, it's all economic, but medical, criminal, social impacts. Who remembers that figure? Seven billion? Nope. Much higher. 11 billion. No, 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 much, 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 much higher. <laughs> Isn't like 300 and 48 million, something like that. Much, much, much or billion. Higher. I don't know. We just went over it in another class. And About 348 like, is billion is getting closer. Yeah. It's, it's actually around it's... 500 billion, um, which is a half a trillion dollars every year spent in the, all of these different areas. That's what it costs us, half a trillion dollars. And then the last item on here is just being able to recognize an example of harm reduction, right? So what are some examples of harm reduction? Moderation management. Yeah, moderation management, yeah. Needle exchange. Needle exchange, yep. Um, Paul. That's a needle exchange is what I was gonna say too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. New York City just opened up a new supervised, a place where people can go 
uh, and actually use inside this place safely. That would be another example of harm reduction, right? Um, you know, maybe they stopped using fentanyl and, but they're still, you know, uh, using cannabis. All right, we might, using a harm reduction approach, the fentanyl is gonna kill you um, or potentially kill you as, as deadly as it is. Um, so cannabis could be viewed as a harm reduction approach, right? So just being able to recognize those kinds of things. And uh, Katrina, I see your hand. Yeah, I was just wondering, do they still have needle exchanges out here in San Diego? Um, I don't have recent information on that. I don't know that they don't. I think they do. Um, but it's been a while since I've actually checked on that. Yeah, because I heard they cl um, closed them or now you have to go to them and yeah, I, yeah, they don't come to you anymore. Yeah, uh, and I don't, I don't know that information. It sounds like your information is a little bit more recent than mine. Yeah, I they, was just wondering. Okay. Yeah, they have some harm reduction programs now. Father Joel's has one that passes out harm reduction packets that has fentanyl testers in it, cotton balls, bottle caps, um, blah, 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 and so on. Juanita, I don't mean to cut you off here, but we are at the end of, okay. our, um, of our presentation. Uh, like I said before, the next two slides is just about the um, vin video vignette, which we practiced last week. This is another example of, that, I, that I could have used, um, another short video. So on the exam itself, it's gonna, like I said, it's gonna be under two minutes. So um, uh, hopefully with all the practice you've done, it'll be an easy note for you guys to write. And it'll be worth 10 points. The other part of the exam would be worth 40 points for a total of 50 points on your final exam. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording now because uh, I'm about to dismiss class, but don't go anywhere just yet.